You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Welcome to episode 135 of a Life in Ruins podcast, where we investigate the careers of those living a life in ruins. I'm your host, Carlton Gover, and today I am joined by this week's guest, Daniel Rede. Daniel, thank you so much for joining us. Real quick, can you please uh, just tell our listeners who you are and what you do? Hi, good morning. Uh, it's good to be on the show. I'm a big fan of what you guys do on this podcast and uh, glad to be uh, included as a speaker. So my name is Daniel Rede. I am a machine-free, hand-poke tattoo artist with a kind of artistic and visual focus on ancient history and the Paleolithic art of France and Western Europe. Right on, man. And today you're joining us from where exactly? Oh, I uh, live and work here in North Island, New Zealand, where it is currently 8 a.m. tomorrow. 8 a.m. 8, yeah, <laughs> t- tomorrow <laughs> for me. Yeah, exactly. No, it's, it's super fun having you. We've been talking with Daniel for months now. And he was one of those guests that got unfortunately caught up in all the the transitions of of the podcast. But today we're super excited to finally have him on on the show to talk. So do you have a background in anthropology or archaeology or archaeology like through education or anything like that? Nope. I have no formal education whatsoever. I'm a enthusiastic layman. <laughs> I think um, the anthropology, archaeology interest kind of comes from, you know, when you really love something, you you don't just love it at a surface level. You start investigating like all the aspects of it. And so for art in general, when art became the main focus in my career and my life, I wanted to know what it was like down to its roots. And so uh, when you start digging down, you start finding that you need to start engaging in anthropology and archaeology to understand art and tattooing at its core. Dude, that's awesome. So, <laughs> you know, our, as you know, you've listened to the show, like the, this first segment is dedicated to like who you are. So what got you into becoming uh, a, an artist and by extension, a tattoo artist? Every child is an artist until they're told not to be. And I was just one of those ones who was never told not to be. So I grew up doing art. Actually, I was going to try to move into concept design for like video games because i grew up in seattle like i could have biked down to the microsoft headquarters and done that but that didn't seem like it would be fulfilling in the same way that i needed you know so i wanted to do tattooing but my wife and i were were spending most of you know my 20s going around on backpacking trips around the world and you can't really settle down into an education while you're jumping from place to place. So when we finally settled down in Belgium, I started looking for a teacher and I got involved with a mentor in Southern Holland who um, introduced me to how to start my career in this uh, field. And what's that process like of, of finding, uh, finding a teacher to, for this art? Like how long does it take to, to finally to, to be led on your own to, to tattoo people? It's, it varies so wildly. There's no formal education. I think some people are trying to start schools for it because the system is a bit old fashioned. We have one mentor and one apprentice usually would be the deal, but there's no regulation about what that mentor needs to teach. There's no time frame for how long it needs to take. The old school guys, like some of the people I know had to just wash cars for their mentor, you know, go bring the beer, go do the something. And then, uh, Finally, if the mentor felt like it after two years of having a slave, they might teach them a bit about tattooing. And so um, for me, my mentor didn't want to waste my time. I was already in my late 20s starting a family. I had to, what, four hours trip one way to get to the studio where I would go take, you know, like a long walk, a long train, four buses, and finally arrive four hours later. And he knew that that was a sign of dedication enough to teach me without wasting my time washing cars or doing like menial tasks. So maybe my education was a little bit quicker because I had um, maybe a little more mutual respect with my mentor. But yeah, with no formal outline or education process, it really varies wildly. Half a year to six years, nobody really 
has any <laughs> gauge on it. Gotcha. So then how did you end up on uh, the North Island in New Zealand? We had done a lot of backpacking trips. I'd gone to Asia twice, um, Central America, met my wife in Nicaragua. And then uh, when she and I had kind of um, finished uh, Mexico and Central America, we jumped down to New Zealand for the working holiday visa and spent a year living in a van down here, saw the whole country, fell in love with the people and the the landscape. And uh, after living in Europe for a while and raising our kid in Brussels, we decided we'd kind of had enough of the big city. And when we thought of like, what would be the best place to, to settle down and raise a family, we decided to come back down here. Yeah, so now we live in a little off-grid, tiny house. I've got my tattoo studio, you know, out in my garden, and it's all coming together. Dude, that's awesome. And what was it like to get a a visa to to live and and work in New Zealand? Because I know they can be pretty strict with with, uh, people coming in. Yeah, we got in at a good time, I think. It was all pre-COVID stuff. We've been here about five years or something. My wife... uh, is a midwife and the hospital was looking for qualified health workers. So actually her career was on a list of, uh, what was it? Skilled migrant shortage, something like that. So she fulfilled the hospital career and now does, um, ceramics for, for fun and for her, uh, career. Excellent. So you had a pretty good life experience traveling the globe, running into people from a whole host of different cultures and backgrounds and beliefs. When did you really start looking into like paleolithic and in and like art and archaeology in your career or even in your personal life? I don't remember really when it would have started for the paleolithic um, fascination. The funny thing is when I wanted to make the switch, so I was trained in machine tattooing by my mentor. But when I wanted to make the switch into hand poke tattooing, I, I taught myself. And uh, a lot of the times we, we will just practice tattooing on ourselves because you don't want to just ask somebody else to be a guinea pig. You, you work on your own leg. And when I was going to try it on myself, I tried to think, what's an image I really want to put on there? It has to be something that really speaks to me. And what's an image I want to put on there that really doesn't matter if it looks a little bit shabby? Because this is the first attempt at hand poking after machine tattoos. And I chose um, one of the, the deer heads from the Lascaux cave in France, because it doesn't really matter if the lines are a little bit messed up or, or something. And uh, when I put it on and I, I had it on my leg and I looked at it, I was like, oh my God, the, the art from that era really comes to life on a cave wall and on skin much more than it does. Like if you printed it out on paper and stuck it on the wall, it's, it doesn't, have its own kind of sense of life until it's on a cave wall or, or on a person because there's the form and the flow of uh, the body that kind of mimics the form and flow of cave walls. And that's how the people would select the right part of the cave wall to paint something on. So it would come around one surface and kind of be displayed in one way or another. And for the human body, it's a lot more like that than it would be just printed the same thing on a piece of paper, flat, and static. So that's awesome, man. Yeah. What was that impetus for you to go from machine tattooing to hand poke? I think the hand poke was always the greater fascination, but being trained in machine tattooing allowed me to live and work and support my family as a tattoo artist. So like I said, when you have a a fascination, you want to know about all of its aspects down to the, down to the bones of it. And um, I feel like the world has quite a few machine tattoo artists now it's it's becoming kind of like a a crowded super highway rushing down towards the newest the fanciest the best and and i wanted to stop rushing and and um kind of take a slower road um to understand um how tattoos can be one of the huge influencing factors of that was that my teacher took me down to volunteer at indigenous tattoo what was it called world culture and indigenous tattoo festival in Mallorca in Spain. So we spent two weeks down there getting to meet and help out and work for and set up a lot of indigenous tattoo cultural revivalists, people from Borneo, Japan, a lot of Polynesian islands, including New Zealand, Samoa, North America, all over the place. 
and then getting to spend two weeks with, with a lot of these people who are doing all of these important uh, functions for themselves and their communities. This was pretty early on when I was still an apprentice, so it was hugely influential um, in my career. And so we did two weeks in Mallorca helping out that one, and then I went as well to Tahiti when there was a follow-up event in 2017. And a lot of the same people came to that, so I got to spend another two weeks volunteering and, and getting to know a lot of the people who are doing indigenous cultural revival uh, more on a, a good friendly level we were you know i was helping them out and, and they knew it and the, there was a good respect it was a lovely way to to spend days actually speaking and telling stories and, and getting to know a lot of the people who are doing this important work when's the next one well, COVID, I think, got right in the way and clogged them all up. There was one recently, actually right here in North Island, New Zealand, in Tauranga, just over the hill. But I was actually away in France. <laughs> I'm not sure if uh, I had even uh, been here, if I would be involved. I'm not sure they needed volunteers. And and uh, I would love to have gone over. I have a lot of friends who are participating. But it's something I've been kind of... Um, Wondering about my place in, in the world of, of tattoo revival, if, if European historical art and tattoo revival counts. And uh, I don't know, I've been struggling to, to find, yeah, my place in that world or in that community. Gotcha. Is there an indigenous art style that you find that you're particularly more fond of than others? Or do you all, do you do just like all of them differently for different reasons? Differently for different reasons. I got invited over to Sarawak in Borneo by a man named Jeremy, who's, who's kind of um, a driving force behind their tattoo revival. I had a great time over there. Jeremy was um, introducing me around, and I got to meet a lot of the guys who are doing their spearheading their tattoo revival. And um, for the Iban people, when their communities get affected by palm oil plantations and the people need to, they get kind of forced into selling their land and then... Once it's sold, it becomes plantations. The people have to go live in the city. He was saying that a lot of the time their population gets a bit homogenized with the greater Malaysian population and um, that it's just the tattoos that would be the identifying marker for who their people were and to not get lost among all the other ethnicities in the city. It's really important for them to wear the tattoos. And he was saying that Everyone who wears one helps them not get lost. So I've got my throat done, my shoulders done with their tattoos because they were like gifts from the people who want the world to remember that they exist, kind of. So those ones always spoke to me. I had saved these spots specifically in the hopes that it could happen and that now having made friends who are part of that, that revival and um, doing really important work, I feel really personally connected. They have an upcoming tattoo convention that I'm trying to really hard, <laughs> trying to save money for so I can fly back to, to Sarawak in uh, February and, uh, and be engaged in that one. That'd be pretty fun. It's a hard question to answer. There's a lot of good art out there. Absolutely. And so are do you strictly just do hand poke now in, in your shop? Yeah. How many folks come to you for, for tattoos? Um, I work... Four days a week now, I think I'm doing, yeah, four, four medium to large tattoos a week. I've been doing a lot of, um, we would call like, I guess, Norse historical uh, lately. My main interest is, is uh, Paleolithic art, um, but uh, I'm having fun just doing big dragons and uh, telling, you know, Viking sagas and myths and, in, in art. And so I spent now probably three years only only hand poke there was a transitional phase but i think i've been tattooing for about eight years yeah when i stopped machine tattooing i just stopped i put the machines down and i haven't touched them since i knew it just was the right move okay and is it you know this is i've never got a, a hand poke i still have a sleeve to finish i see that but uh yeah, I know. It's I've been needing to finish it for quite some time now. It makes it a little bit difficult when you move across the country away from your artist. Yep. Can you do uh, color tattoos with with hand poke? Or, yeah. Yeah. Where you're still using um, modern tattoo ink. Modern tattoo ink just goes into the skin. It stays there. It's uh, 
It's pretty right. easy. I've tried some ink making. It's one of the things that when I have a little more time, I'll, I'll try to really um, focus on. It's, uh, it's not as easy as it would seem. And uh, I've had mixed results in the few that I've tried on myself with, with homemade ink. There's some debates going on about ochre being used in, in ink. You know, there's some Sarmatian toolkits that have ochre pigments that are, I would say, they seem quite definitively tattooing toolkits in the in the graves um, they found over in the Sarmatian burial site, Philip Ofka. And I've never seen any modern tattoos that have been made with color ink from natural pigments like that. I mean, like really natural pigments in their raw form, but I'm pretty curious about that. So I might start doing some, some research in that regard as well. Gotcha. Well, all right, man. Well, all right, everyone, we're going to go ahead and take a break. We'll be right back for episode 135 after these messages. And we're back to episode 135 Life from Roots podcast. We're still here with Daniel. So Daniel, you have a mutual connection to, to us at Life and Roots podcast. You happen to not only know but work with Dr. Aaron Dieterwolf. So how in the hell did you get hooked up with him? So Aaron's Instagram account, uh, Archaeology Inc., um, which I think when I re-listened to his episode with you guys, David was pushing him to start, something like that. Archaeology Inc. is tattooing, body modification, and archaeology. I think there's not really a reason why any of that wouldn't have been my favorite Instagram account to follow. When I found it, I was instantly hooked on his posts, his content, the insights and, uh, and interest. It was just, uh, exciting. You know, I, I love his, uh, his page. So in the beginning, when I found it, I was, you know, engaging a little bit with the comments and asking little questions or, or, or supporting the, the work that he'd you know, done to portray that image or, or speak about it. But when um, one morning he posted a specific article about his research into Andean mummies and their tattoos, I looked at all the pictures of this uh, of this tattooed uh, hand, wrist, forearm. I read the whole article that you know the post that he had made. I looked at the picture again. I read the whole post again, and I thought, oh, it's a bit strange. He didn't mention the the kind of layout of the tattoos because obviously this one came before this one and this is built up off of that. And this one is a bit different from that one and even has a greater saturation of ink. And a lot of little details that are obvious from a tattooing perspective, but maybe they weren't important enough to be mentioned in the, in the uh, post he did. But I figured I would just kind of reach out and say, hey, it's interesting that that part was done before that part because the rest is built up off of it. And I don't know if that is important to your research, but it's maybe worth noting. And he happened to be online at the time and said, like, well, what do you mean? I said, well, obviously, if you're going to make this tattoo, you know, you're going to sit with that person's wrist in your lap. You're going to tattoo the wristband part first. And then this kind of stair step pattern that we see in these mummies, which I think also was part of their textile history. The stair step pattern would be built off of the wristband. That way, the stair step pattern ends on a straight line that just, you know, when the arm is hanging down by your side, it just makes more sense to do that way. You wouldn't start at the top and work your way down and hopefully end it on the right angle. You start from the bottom and build up. And he said, well, yeah, actually, we never really thought about that. Okay. And uh, let's look at those wristbands because the mummy has, I don't have the picture in front of me. I think two wristbands, maybe three. The lowest one is strikingly different from the other tattoos on the arm in that the wristband itself was tattooed. Now that we've researched this a bit further, I think we can safely say it's tattooed with an entirely different tool set from the rest of the arm because the lines there are short dashes, little lines that form a, a, a technique we're calling line stacking. And it just had never been noticed before because maybe people were or observing different aspects of the, the art, different things about the mummy, but it just had never really been analyzed from a tattoo perspective before. And over the course of, I don't know, two hours when I was just chatting with him that morning, we really not only observed this separate tattooing style, but then uh, found a way to identify it 
as separate from the other. And uh, after two hours, he said, okay, hang on a second. And he got back to me and he said, okay, as sad as it is, I think that was the first written conversation in any of the notes that he had regarding tattooing tools and techniques used on these mummies. It just had never really been discussed in detail before. The tattoos had been discussed, but not really how they had been made, if the, if the tattoos varied at all, anything like that. And so he said it was a little depressing that it had happened on Instagram with, uh, with somebody who was not an archaeologist and over breakfast. It was like a funny little insight. So from there, Aaron brought me on as sort of an outside consultant on some of his research. So I got to to see the kind of uh, visual data archive from the Oxford Re- Oxford University Museum for the Peruvian um, and Andean mummy remains and analyze a lot of those images and see if we notice anything that stands out. But what, what we keep seeing now that we're now that we know what to look for is this uh, this line stacking technique separate from the majority of the tattoos being hand poked probably by cactus thorn needles. We don't know quite yet. We're also finally, after about a year of emails, I think getting permission to go observe some uh, Indian mummy remains in a museum in Berlin as well. So I need to get back over there and try to try to do that. So just a, uh, a random conversation you had on Instagram was able to like fundamentally shift, uh, shift Aaron's thinking <laughs> towards his practice. And that's, I mean, that's like phenomenal, right? Cause like archeologists, uh, you know, a lot of the things that we study, we're not necessarily experts in the production of, you know, some of these ancient practices, you know, not all of us who study ceramics or potters ourselves. Like that's, I think that's fundamentally a big, uh, you know, truth or, you know, Aaron is not a tattoo artist and has made a really cool niche in archaeology, looking at the archaeology of tattoos and like so on and so forth. And it really goes to show having someone who's knowledgeable in in the craft is critical in understanding how it's done in the past. Like it reminds me of, it's like this story of these Italian archaeologists found this cube-shaped you know, artifact in the, in Northern Italy near the, near the mountains. And they had no idea what it was. And just one of them happened to show it to his grandmother and his grandmother took it and knew exactly that it's uh, a device used to help make mittens to, to knit mittens, you know, just <laughs> like she's a knitter and like knew exactly what that was. And it matches the place and time that like, yeah, of course you'd find something to, to help you make, make knit, uh, knit mittens. So wow. that's just, Yeah, that's, I mean, that's just such a phenomenally cool story and and just also goes to show how important it is for archaeologists to engage with the public, you know, especially on social media. And Aaron's like killing it on on social media too. Yeah. And uh, I really have enjoyed my time with uh, Aaron. And when I participated, when I gave a talk at the tattoo convention in Denver, you know, just how enthralled the tattoo artists were. And how they came back the next day with practice stick poke ta- or hand poke tattoos from cactus needles that they went out. And it was just like, holy hell, man. So, dude, that is just, that's awesome. And I, and I do have to ask, so you're talking about how like you'll practice on yourself. Do you have like a dedicated leg of just tattoo doodles that you got going yeah, on? Or I think most tattoo artists do. Yeah. You need both hands, right? You need one hand for tattooing, one hand for stretching. So yeah. mostly the only place you can do it practice on yourself is on your legs so yeah yeah i mean there's a lot there's a lot of practice that does because i also do so much experimentation now you know i needed to do experimenting with obsidian blades because now that's a part of my practice and i was not going to test it on somebody else and uh you know practice hand poking practice hand poking with bird bones practice hand poking i've got cactus needles i've got lemon tree thorns i've got all sorts there's a lot of questions to answer. Oh, I can imagine. It was like, can you not just use like pig skin? It's been a common theme, right? In, in testing so many things for science, you know, uh, even Aaron himself did a, a, a research um, portion of uh, identifying the um, micro wear patterns in potential tattooing needles so that they could be analyzed, 
you know, if you find, let's say, what might have been classified as a hairpin at an archaeological site, but you look at the very tip of it and the last two millimeters has this particular microware pattern. He did that in pig skin. He tattooed the pig skin with these needles and, and human skin with the needles and, and analyzed it. But what the difference is in the skin of a living human versus the skin of a dead pig is that the tattoo won't go through any healing process. Because oh. skin. And the healing process is huge. It's about half the battle, really. And so you're with the pig skin, you're probably going to get like a false positive. The ink will mm-hmm. go in, it will stay in, and nothing will happen to it. Whereas uh, when you tattoo a person, I think you get you know, different results. So when Aaron and I outlined an idea, put together a project, we, uh, we knew it had to be tested on human skin because um, this particular project was uh, revolved around the idea of identifying tool signatures and how each um, different kind of tool, tool shape, needle arrangement leaves a particular mark in human skin. And the tattoos uh, I did during this experiment on my leg had to be monitored for six months after the tattooing was finished so that we could watch how they heal, what the differences are, if any of it falls out. And so uh, we spent about a year putting the project together just over email and Instagram. We collaborated with indigenous tattoo artist Maya Siluk Jacobson, who is an um, Inuit uh, tattoo revivalist and I think also anthropologist and she um, she was uh, brought on to help advise we <laughs> we wanted to uh, be really thorough so the outline of the project was to do eight identical tattoos with eight different tools and then compare the results so that when we find a mummy from this place or that place this culture or that culture we can rule out certain uh, materials as uh, having been used for tattooing, because let's say it matches one style, but not another style. So now we have all this comparison data to have a look at those mummy tattoos in greater detail. So when we wanted to think of the eight different styles we wanted to include, Aaron suggested including skin stitching. And I thought, well, this is called subdermal tattooing. It's a practice of passing a a needle and thread where the thread has been dipped in tattoo ink and passed through your skin and pull it out the other side and the thread leaves tattoo ink under that stitch. So skin stitch tattooing is a uh, tattooing practice of the Arctic Circle and I was very hesitant to include it because I know that it's a very closely guarded practice and I didn't want to step on any toes or or make anybody feel like I was, um, yeah, treading on their, their tattoo revival. So I was a little reluctant to include that part until Aaron convinced me that bringing Maya on board and making sure that she knew that this was the only time I'd be doing this technique and I wasn't going to just steal it and make it a part of my practice. So we had then another six months of communication with her where she coached me through a bit of how to do the technical side of, of that tattooing style, which is so difficult for the women who, who practice that style. I, I think you'd have to spend a lifetime at it. It's really incredible. So I, I was under her guidance, did a little bit of practice on my leg with that, and then had to make a bunch of very small bone sewing needles, find the right kind of bone to use, spend a bunch of time figuring out how to make sewing needles out of bone small enough to pass through the skin. And then uh, we also brought on another uh, traditional tattoo artist named uh, Moko Nui Arangi Smith. He's a uh, hand-tapping tattoo artist based up in Auckland. So he came down to do two of the tattoos that day because I couldn't reach that part of my leg very well. And his hand tapping experience is at the very highest level. He's a really remarkable artist as well. And so he came down to do the two tattoos. I did the six other tattoos on my leg that day, including skin stitching, obsidian blade cuts, and then ink rubbed in obsidian shard poking. So hand poking with an obsidian spike, deer bone tattoo needle, copper tattoo needle, modern tattoo needle, the skin stitch with bird bone and hand tapped with a comb style needle and hand tapped with a single needle. So we have a pretty broad range of tools and and uh, needles and material types to get a, a fair idea of the different marks they leave and how to identify those marks at a, at a microscopic level, because everything we did was uh, 
documented under the, you know, under higher magnification, even the healing process every couple of weeks, another set of pictures was taken. So now um, a lot of that data is available in the article that Aaron published for the Exarch Journal, Experimental Archaeology. We had been given a generous grant from them to pursue this research. And then only just uh, a couple months ago, the article came out where you can read Aaron's findings and it's written up by somebody who has the, the backing of a <laughs> archaeology degree. And uh, I, uh, I'm i really honored to have been a part of that. It was really fun. I mean, the list of, uh, of, of different techniques you just list, you know, just talked about cutting yourself with an obsidian blade and then rubbing ink in it. Like how that must be like conceptually difficult. How do you do that properly without cutting too, too deep? That's actually the main risk. I had done one or two little test trials like that uh, on my leg before it comes down to how you break the obsidian and how that edge is at a microscopic level. Um, after this project and after analyzing those obsidian flakes under magnification, we see as well that sometimes tiny fragments break off the cutting edge. Those can get lost or even embedded in the skin, making those tattoos a little slower to heal sometimes, but it depends uh, what the shape of the blade was. How do I get into it? I don't know. I have questions that need answers and I don't <laughs> care what the consequences are. Tattooing with obsidian is a huge part of my practice now. I just got back from a tattoo convention. I think I did four obsidian tattoos there, another one just yesterday. I'm finding it immensely interesting. And so the obsidian, I, I source it, I break the flakes off, I clean and then sterilize them in a medical autoclave. And so they're ready to be used safely as tattooing tools, as long as I don't cut too deeply. Yeah, <laughs> it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> I'm, I I, I kind of want one now. That sounds like, that sounds awesome. And you could this, use a holiday, are, man. Just come down here. It's summer. I'm, yeah, that's true. Although the flight tickets, I imagine, are like, what, two grand just to get down there? Yeah, probably. Yeah, just a, just a little bit. But maybe, yeah, we'll talk in the interim. Yeah, we'll be right back <laughs> with episode 135. I got questions. And we're back, still here with Daniel for episode 135. So just kind of starting off. Something that I'm sure you've noticed and I've, and I've seen, like there's that, there's a really great Russell Peters. I know he's an older comedian at this point, but he, there's a bit where he talks about, he sees this like white dude in the audience with this like Japanese style dragon tattoo sleeve. And he starts ragging on the guy. He's like, wait, are you from Japan? And the guy's like, no. And he, and he's like, well, why do you have that tattoo? So in the world of, of art and, and, and tattooing art, like what, is that discourse like because you you've mentioned in the in the first part that you do like a lot of like european style tattoos now specifically like scandinavian influenced on i imagine the uh new zealanders with european descent so how do you navigate that space of like where art is such this ubiquitous thing where people can appreciate and admire from all backgrounds of life and want to have it displayed on their bodies even though they might not be from the culture in which those art forms are produced? It's a big question. The tattoo world is really, in a lot of ways, um, on the, uh, the front line of battles surrounding cultural appropriation. And uh, unfortunately, there, it's become so easy to become a tattoo artist that without a, a teacher to kind of guide you through, this means this, this is the history behind that, this comes from here and answering a lot of those kinds of questions. A lot of people just kind of jump into drawing and tattooing without understanding. And it leads to a lot of problems. Cultural appropriation is a, is a huge issue in the tattoo world. And um, there's been some instances where really just good people I know didn't realize that maybe they shouldn't have been doing something with their art and then reminding them that like, Hey, maybe have another think about that. And they go, Oh yeah, actually. Yeah. Good point. I didn't think about it. And I think it, a lot of the time it just comes down to the fact that they're trying to do art to support them. It's their, it's their life. That's how they pay the bills, you know, and uh, taking the time to kind of 
dive in and, and learn everything, everything, everything is uh, time consuming when you're just trying to, you know, get to work. It's probably how it always persists. I think we live in a world now where with the amount of um, access to information we have, we should be able to do our homework, not start stepping on people's toes, not involve ourselves in, in, in business that we, we shouldn't be doing. And um, I think it's up to each artist to decide where the line is, what they want to, what they want to be drawing and portraying. I'm going to be moving. Hopefully <laughs> we always need the clients to, uh, to support us as we move forward because we can't just, you know, have a career tattooing ourselves or, or paper. Uh, so we, uh, we need clients to support us as we move forward. And um, I'm going to try to make real steps where, the only art I'm going to be tattooing on people is art based in European roots. So Paleolithic art, also some Norse, uh, Norse revival art as well. Um, I find pretty interesting with my interest in the art of the mid to upper Paleolithic. I can't pull myself away from that fascination. And it, uh, it pulled me back even if I tried to, um, to step away from it. And, um, if your question is uh, how do we identify cultural appropriation in, in tattooing art and how do we find ways to navigate better courses of action for tattoo artists, it would have to just come down to the one artist at a time. Probably if you're getting a tattoo, ask questions. If you're not satisfied with that person's answers, maybe go somewhere else. And if you feel like it, let them know that their approach is not appropriate. Uh, I live here in New Zealand. I have a lot of friends who are Tamoko Maori tattoo artists. I don't touch that art style. It's just not for me to participate in. I can admire it. I can have friends who practice it. You know, if they make a, a t-shirt, I'll wear it. I'll come support them. I'm going to be working with my good friend, Julius, who's a Tamoko artist at the next tattoo convention. Um, we're going to have a good time, but that art style is um, off limits for me and then I think that that's a healthy division to, to make. I just couldn't give to it what they give to it anyway. Even if it came from a place of love, it was just not, not for my hands to perform. Gotcha. Totally understand that and, and absolutely respect what you have to say as well. Because here in the States, you see a lot of guys with like Maori tattoos, like, you know, and they're gorgeous. I've always admired that art style too, but I know like that art style is like very particular to the artist and to the people that it came from. And it has meaning behind it. It's not just like this random amalgamation of lines and designs. It's like, I don't, I don't want to cross those, cross those lines, but so what else do you have coming up? Are you still working with Aaron or there's other, are there other archeologists that you've been able to get in contact with and, and collaborate on projects with? Yep. So my next project, which I, I feel like I'm a little behind on already. Um, I've just come back from Europe and it was a uh, busy time. We're going to look into tool material types with uh, Anne Austin, who's a PhD Egyptologist. Uh, she's uh, been documenting a lot of uh, Egyptian mummies under infrared light and finding that a greater number of them have uh, been tattooed than was previously expected. And so she and I will start uh, a project where I'm going to do another set of tattoos on myself with uh, traditional materials analyze those results so that maybe we can have a better idea of were the Egyptians tattooed with ostrich bone, spikes from sharp plants like acacia thorns, maybe gold tattoo needles, maybe animal horn. So we'll test a few different materials and needle, needle setups. I'm also going to do a follow-up with that um, in regards to the Pesaric mummies, the Siberian mummies uh, that, we, that we found in the, the Altai Mountains. I talked a little bit once with uh, Gino Caspari about that, and um, I think he would be interested in being a kind of voice of authority on what the, the Scythians and Scythian-like people um, of, around that time would have had access to in regards to what type of metal they might have been using and how finely that kind of metal can be worked. So I'll need to then do some metal working, make some tools and needle arrangements uh, with maybe bronze, copper, gold, if I can get my hands on it and, and test out what the tools might have been for performing those tattoos. The interesting thing is in, in Aaron's book, Archaeology Inc., 
he talks a bit about, um, I'm not sure if that part was written by him or his um, co-author Lars Kurtak, but they talk about a Sarmatian tattooing kit. These kinds of tattooing kits have been found in grave sites from the Sarmatian Empire. But no mummies have ever been found preserved with tattoos, which those kits would have made. They find mummies from the Scythian Empire, but no tools that could have made those tattoos. So we kind of have two questions, and two, you know, two sets of questions, two sets of answers, but nobody really has a good guess so far as to what the tools look like that make the, the Pesaric tattoos. So we're going to look into a bit of that. I think Aaron will probably be involved in both the Egyptian and Pesaric projects as well. He's incredibly knowledgeable and insightful, and, and it's a good combination. I think it was inevitable when I, I re-listened to his episode on your podcast, I think episode four, he was saying that when he was producing all of this um, science communication content, trying to engage the public, um, he was looking for insightful comments and, and discussions and collaboration. I think the quote was, a, a rising tide raises all ships. It doesn't really matter who you find to work with as long as it's a person who's looking to help uh, <laughs> answer your questions with you. I think uh, if since Aaron is a tattoo-focused archaeologist and I'm an archaeologically fascinated tattoo artist, between him and I, we fill a lot of gaps. Like there's, It's just a really good combination, and I can't believe somebody else didn't you know, beat me to this relationship where I get to tattoo in the name of science. It's, uh, <laughs> it's the high point of my career. Yeah, that's awesome, dude. That's really, it's really cool to see how you've gotten into this line of research in such a meaningful way and it, and coming off of, you know, just simply an Instagram DM that has opened up all these different lines of thought and research questions. And like, I just think that is one of the beauties of science and why science, like I said in the you know, last segment, why science communication is just so necessary for this field to connect people with, to connect researchers with modern day people who are engaging in the practices that we study the material remains of, right? So, dude, that's that's just, I'm really excited to see what you guys come up with, <laughs> with next. Tattoos are one of those modern day cultural phenomenons, not the right word, but people like tattoos. And I think, and, and this has come from a layman, like we've seen more and more people get tattoos. It's become way more common practice, especially in like American culture. And it's like how David is so successful. People love dogs and they're fascinated <laughs> with yeah. dogs. And he talks about, dog, you know, it's just like, it's one of those one of those shared interests across the globe that people can relate to and get involved in and, and contribute to in, in meaningful ways. So I, I, I just think what you're doing is absolutely amazing in that it's just part of your work and you get to, you get to, you get to do it and, and, and such, and I've said meaningful so many times before, but you get to do it in a real way <laughs> with Aaron and others. Like that's just, that's awesome, dude. So as it goes, before we end the show, Daniel, what are a couple sources? These could be books, articles, or videos that you would re recommend for anyone uh, interested in, in tattooing or ancient artistic practices. I recently received Aaron and Lars's book, uh, Archaeology Inc., which really covers it well. It's a really academic but, but really interesting book. So I think for academics or, or laypersons, it's a good read. I'm also um, got... Gino Caspari's book, uh, The Book of Mummies, which is uh, also really good. He invited me to be a, a chap, a contributor to that book. And I had a, I originally said yes, but I had to turn him down because I was like, dude, I don't know if I can talk about these ritual mortuary practices in the plains quite yet. And that's like a whole different line of stuff. I'm just not prepared to. This was like a couple of years ago in the yeah. throes of COVID. And I was like, dude, I just want to survive and play civilization. I don't want to work on something as hard as looking at trying to get around nagpra and stuff like that i gotta i gotta check out that book though that's awesome yeah you can also find our exarch journal entry which is aaron's published version of our project we did comparing the tattoo tools absolutely yeah and we'll have uh, that all those in the episode description wherever you listen to your podcast and where can our listeners find you on social media daniel 
So my Instagram is called Totemic Tattoo, T-O-T-E-M-I-C underscore tattoo. And I have a new website for my studio, which is the-temple-tattoo.com. Sweet. And uh, an email address? Totemictattoo at gmail.com. Perfect. And we'll have all those links as well in the episode description. So thank you for joining us today, Daniel. If given a chance again, would you still choose to uh, to live a life tattooing modern day people on practices and designs that come from people in ruins? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I would have even gotten an earlier start. Dude, absolutely. It's been phenomenal having you on. Well, I definitely have to have you back. So everyone, we just interviewed Daniel Riday. You can find him on Instagram at totemic underscore tattoo. His email address, totemictattoo at gmail.com and his new website, thetempletattoo.com. Once again, all those will be in the episode description below. Please, please, please be sure to rate and review the podcast and provide us with any feedback on whichever podcast and platform you're listening to our show. We really do appreciate the comments that we're getting and, and the reviews. It really helps us. You can always send us an email at a life room with podcast at gmail.com. Many of you do. We really appreciate what you guys have to say and we get... We have a couple listeners that like to provide us with reviews of all of our episodes. And we apparently our episode on uh, the archaeology of Middle Earth deeply upset one of our followers, Archeo Dunedain. We're really sorry for our transgression on uh, Middle Earth archaeology. We'll have to have you on the show sometime and, and teach us everything we need to know. We, we apologize. Every time we get into someone else's fandom, we, we goof and we acknowledge that. And then as always, if you're listening to our show on the All Shows feed, please subscribe to our individual show. Doing so allows us to grow our numbers, which helps us get advertisers and sponsors so we can continue to make great content because the All Shows feed is its own separate show, has its own separate metrics, and it really makes it difficult for us to really know who's listening to our show from where and what age groups like. So please just Life in Ruins on whatever podcasting platform, just subscribe to us personally and listen to us. We greatly appreciate it. And with that, we are out. Thanks for listening to a Life in Ruins podcast. You can follow us on Instagram and Facebook at a Life in Ruins podcast. And you can also email us at a Life in Ruins podcast at gmail.com. And remember, make sure to bring your archaeologists in from the cold and feed them beer. This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV traveling the United States, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, DigTech LLC, Cultural Media, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Chris Webster. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com.